Working on such topics as class actions, mass tort litigation, aggregate settlements, and coordination among lawyers. Many other accomplishments, um, which I can leave for you to read in, in written bios. We'll move on next to Manuel Gomez, who is Associate Professor of Law at Florida International University. He specializes in comparative complex litigation, international arbitration, and other topics mainly related to Latin America. He leads FIU's Global Legal Studies Initiative and recently launched Venezuelan Studies Initiative and is also a fellow at the Center on the Legal Profession here at Stanford. Again, also many other accomplishments, which I'll leave you to review uh, in the written program. Christopher Wittock, Professor of Law at UC Irvine School of Law. Um, and a faculty affiliate, I'm sorry, did I pronounce that? Whitehawk. Whitehawk, sorry. Uh, faculty affiliate of the UC Irvine Center in Law, Society, and Culture, and the John and Marilyn Long U.S. China Institute <coughs> for Business and Law. He's taught courses on international law, civil procedure, conflict of laws, foreign relations law, business associations, and international relations theory. His research focuses on transnational litigation, conflict of laws, international law, and the role of domestic law and domestic courts in global governance. Again, accomplishments too numerous to mention here, um, but I direct you to his CV for further information. So a very distinguished panel with both depth and breadth in the topics we're going to cover this afternoon. Um, and with that, uh, we'll begin our conversation. Great to be here. I'm, I'm learning a ton about um, about this litigation. I look forward to, to learning from uh, Manuel and Chris about um, enforcement of judgments and some of these transnational litigation problems. I want to talk about forum non. Um, I want to talk about forum non convenience as it relates to the enforcement of judgments. And basically ask, ask this question: rather than rather than face the embarrassing possibility of refusing to enforce a judgment because it's corrupt after having sent a lawsuit to that very legal system, um, would it be better to raise the forum non-standard, to raise the standard for, for adequate alternative forum um, so that cases remain in the US in, in the first place? Uh, and my answer is, is a resounding no. Uh, a, the, uh, to me, the ex ante question of forum non-convenience is an utterly different question from the ex post question of enforcing a judgment, even if there are overlapping ideas there. But the Chevron story makes it, it makes it so tempting to tinker. Um, and, and so I'm going to try to lay out the argument for why the, the adequate alternative forum standard should, um, should remain excruciatingly low, um, despite the very strange way it played out in, in this Chevron story. For my purposes, the short version of, of the Chevron story is um, as follows. Yes, Ecuadorians who sue in the United States. The defendant says this litigation doesn't belong in the United States. It belongs in Ecuador. The plaintiffs um, and the court raise questions about whether Ecuador's courts are good enough, whether they're clean enough, whether they're going to function well enough. Um, they say there are problems of, um, of integrity. Um, the defendant says Ecuador's courts are just fine and insists that, that the dispute can be litigated there. So it ends up getting litigated um, there. The US, the US court um, grants dismissal on grounds of forum nonconvenience. The dispute belongs in Ecuador, goes to Ecuador. The plaintiffs sue in Ecuador, and, and they get a huge judgment. Um, and now the defendant says, this judgment can't be enforced. The, the Ecuador courts are corrupt. Um, the, the irony is um, it's, it is magnificent. I mean, it's, it's so magnificent as to be, um, as to be almost painful. Um, and, and we're tempted to shout hypocrisy. I mean, we're tempted to shout hypocrisy from the plaintiffs, hypocrisy from the defendants. Um, I don't see it that way at all. Um, I, at, at the outset, plaintiffs preferred a US forum. Um, there, that was a perfectly reasonable strategic choice. Frankly, had I been in their shoes, I would have done the same thing, um, even, though I could, even though it gets complicated. Um, at the outset, the defendants preferred Ecuador if they were going to be sued at all. They certainly didn't prefer the US. Um, and 
that was a reasonable strategic choice. Um, they moved for form non-dismissal. Frankly, if I had been in their shoes, um, I would have done the same thing, even though, again, that can be complicated. And then after the judgment, I see nothing surprising or all that troubling in the fact that the plaintiffs then try to enforce the judgment that they got in the courts that they were sent to, or in the fact that the defendants try to resist enforcement of that judgment based on evidence that there were real problems in, in the way that judgment was obtained. So, so you know, things look very different ex ante and ex post. Whatever, whatever wrongdoing there may have been in this story, it was not in the fact that at the outset each side preferred a different forum and then they, and then they flip flop. Um, but look, even, even if there's not hypocrisy in it, even if that's the wrong way to, to think of it, there's certainly, a, there, there's certainly an appearance of incongruity, okay? And, and, um, and, and not just in the lawyer's strategy, but also in the court's decisions. First, we've got the Southern District of New York saying Ecuador is an adequate alternative forum. Ecuador is where the dispute belongs. And then we have the Southern District of New York saying the judgment is not enforceable um, because the courts of Ecuador um, uh, were not... Um, we're not adequate at all. Um, and and it's, it's really tempting to try to resolve this incongruity. We might try to resolve it by raising the standard for adequate alternative forum um, so, that, um, so that we don't grant forum nonconvenience if the alternative forum um, is prone to corruption or other problems. It's tempting to try to resolve the incongruity by saying if a defendant argues that Ecuador is an adequate alternative forum, then the, then the defendant should be stopped from later challenging the adequacy of that forum. Um, I, don't, I, I, I don't want to try to resolve the incongruity because I don't think it's incongruous. That I think these are different questions. The, on forum nonconvenience, the question is, does the dispute belong in a different forum? I mean, the, the, the name forum nonconvenience, it, I think, is misleading. It, it makes us think that it's about convenience. And yeah, there's the, the, the private interest factors under Piper Aircraft have aspects of convenience. But at, at its heart, it's about principle. At its heart, it's about sovereignty. Um, so in this case, we're talking about uh, it's a dispute about alleged harm to Ecuador's environment. It's, it's a dispute about alleged harm to Ecuadorian citizens. It's a dispute that implicates the Republic of Ecuador's control over its natural resources, over its own territory. In terms of balancing forum non-factors, it's not a hard case. This is a dispute um, that in almost every way belonged in Ecuador. Um, but then there's, that, then there's the adequate alternative forum requirement. And that, the adequate alternative forum requirement is, and, and it ought to be part of the forum non um, analysis. Is Ecuador an adequate alternative forum? Um, and on this question, um, it seems to me that, that the standard should be, um, the standard should be rock bottom. The standard should be um, bare bones. Does the country have a functioning uh, court system? Can the defendants be sued there? Adequate alternative forum, um, it's different from the other forum non-factors. Public uh, interest factors, private interest factors, they're factors, they're balancing, they're, they're weighing, they're a sliding scale. Adequate alternative forum is not a sliding scale. It's binary. It, it's yes or no. It's check the box. If, if a forum is not more or less adequate for purposes of forum non convenience, at least it shouldn't be. It, does the country have, have a functioning court system? Can the defendants be sued there? If, if there's a concern that the defendants can't be sued there, if the defendants are going to raise objections on grounds of jurisdiction or statute of limitations, of, of course the defendant should be expected to waive those objections. The defendant is saying this case should be dismissed because there's another place where it makes more sense for us to be sued. So, so, of course, we need the adequate alternative forum requirement in that sense. Um, but adequate alternative forum should not be about whether we feel comfortable with the forum. 
Um, it should not be about whether the foreign country's courts um, resemble our own. Um, so Bert Newborn earlier you know, raised a challenge to Ted Boutros about um, you know, say, saying, isn't Texaco's Chevron really sig quite significantly at fault here for having moved for <coughs> forum nonconvenience dismissal, taking the case out of these pretty well-functioning courts in the U.S. and sending it to a system that there was reason to think would be much more problematic. And, and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful point, I think, in the moment for challenging Boutros, it, it was helpful, but, but when you get down to it, most legal systems don't look anything like the U.S. court system, for better or worse. It's not so clear to me that the U.S. court system is the best of all possible worlds. But even, even if it were, like, even, if we could, even if we could demonstrate that a foreign legal system is, is flat out inferior, that should not be a basis for denying the foreign legal system um, the opportunity to adjudicate a dispute of primary interest to that country's citizens. Um, so I think also of Judith Kimmerling's point earlier about class actions. Saying, look, U.S. courts offer some amazing procedures for handling mass disputes, class actions being foremost among them. And, and I, you know, I think the implication was that there would have been something to say for keeping this litigation in the U.S. courts. But look, most countries don't have U.S.-style class actions. Deborah knows more about this than, than anybody in the world. Um, and even though the trend is toward a bit of the spreading of U.S.-style class actions, um, we are still the exception. And, and I don't see what gives the U.S. the right to say that another country in handling the disputes of it that are of, of greatest relevance to its own citizens ought to have this or that procedure. If, if in the forum nonsense, a dispute belongs to a foreign country, and if week after week, that foreign country's court system resolves the disputes that belong to that country, I don't see what entitles um, a US judge on a forum non-motion to say that the, that the foreign system is not good enough to resolve this particular dispute. That ex ante question, where I think the standard ought to be so bare bones, um, seems quite different to me from the ex post question of whether a US court has to enforce a foreign judgment if there are real problems with that judgment. So, you know, especially in the case where, in, when in the particular case, there are concerns about fraud or corruption. Ex post, at that, at that point, we're talking about whether a US court should participate in a wrong which is a very different question from the ex ante question. Um, so all day long today, we've, we've been hearing about um, this, this mess that is the, um, the Chevron Ecuador litigation story. Um, and and I, I guess the question we can ask ourselves is, knowing what we know now about how this mess has played out, you know, what, I mean, whatever we think about who has the dirtier hands in this litigation, I think we can all agree that it's been a mess and that the way things played out in Ecuador wasn't, um, wasn't all that pretty. Uh, but, but knowing what we know, do we, wish, do we wish the lawsuit had stayed in the U.S. to begin with? If we could rewind to the beginning, if I could rewind, would I want the Southern District of New York to deny the forum non-convenience motion, keep the case in the U.S.? And my answer is no, I wouldn't want that. Uh, I, I would want the U.S. court to grant the forum non-motion, to let the litigation proceed in Ecuador, um, reserving for later the very important question of whether to refuse enforcement of the judgment if that particular judgment was corruptly obtained. From the outset, of this litigation. There were fears that, that Ecuador's courts were vulnerable to, to corruption. Um, and now there's at least significant evidence to suggest that those fears may have been um, well-founded, even if they played out in somewhat opposite directions than the parties had, had feared. Um, 
But at its core, I can't get away from the fact that this was an Ecuadorian dispute primarily. Um, and the courts of Ecuador were entitled to a, to a shot at resolving it. Um, it seems to me US courts should be loath to label a foreign legal system uh, facially inadequate to handle that country's dispute. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you to the organizers uh, of this uh, wonderful uh, symposium for the invitation and uh, and for the and to everyone else for the for the rich discussion. So far, it's been music to my ears, even though it's mm -hmm. a it's a sad story and a very expensive one for those who are who are paying for this. So, if, if anyone suggests that a final judgment is the end of a court case, we can say with certain degree of confidence that they're probably wrong. Mm. As we know from real life, and, and the Chevron Ecuador case is a good example of it, once the parties to a court case have obtained a final judgment, they're just halfway there. In the domestic setting, the mechanism for enforcing a judgment is, is generally straightforward. But when two or more jurisdictions are involved, it could get fairly complicated. On the one hand, the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments relies on a patchwork of multilateral and bilateral treaties, domestic law principles, national statutes, and judicial cooperation, cooperating agreements between states. To a certain extent, and, and I think the Chevron case is a very good example of that, enforcement is also conditioned by the political environment of the nations involved. And last but not def definitely not least, the recognition of enforcement is always, and I want to underline this, uh, affected by the litigation strategies pursued by the parties, who will typically embark on a quest of global proportions, geared to find the most favorable jurisdiction to attain their goals, either to impede the judgment or to, or to finally materialize that. So the Chevron uh, Ecuador litigation, or the Lago Agra litigation, however you, you want to prefer, uh, talk, call it, sorry, is a very useful example for those of us interested in looking at this multi-layered, multi-step process of enforcing a foreign judgment in different jurisdictions. It is particularly helpful to understand the interplay between the procedural steps routinely required by the national laws of the enforcing jurisdictions, the treaty obligations assumed by the nations involved, the statutory defenses allowed by the part to the parties, and the litigation strategies employed by counsel to effectively assist or impede the judgment from being fulfilled. As it currently stands, the centerpiece in this litigation is the $18.2 billion judgment issued by an Ecuadorian court against Chevron on February 14th of 2012. Coincidentally, that judgment will be two years old next week. So even before the final judgment was rendered, the defendant had initiated a preemptive strategy to inhibit any potential recognition and enforcement in the United States and elsewhere. And this is not the, the first time it has happened, but it's certainly a unique strategy that, that should be highlighted in this case. Although Chevron is an American company, the US is not the only jurisdiction where the prevailing plaintiffs are able to seek enforcement. Moreover, despite the fact that the main case was solely litigated in Ecuador, so it was a domestic dispute for the purposes of the Ecuadorian judicial system, it was not necessarily meant to be enforced there. And I'm going to go, I will get back to this towards the end of my presentation when discussing the party's strategies. So here you have a litigation in a place where you're not really intending to enforce the judgment. As we all know, Chevron doesn't have any assets in Ecuador, as it would obviously be the case of any smart defendant in its same position. Chevron, however, has more than 70 wholly owned subsidiaries around the world and assets in every country. Many of the company's global operations and financial activities are publicly available. Every year, the company has to file most of this information to regulators around the world and to its thousands of shareholders. As a result, even if Chevron wanted to hide its assets, and uh, many defeated par as many defeated parties do or, at or are tempted to do in the wake of an adverse court judgment, and I'm not suggesting by any means that Chevron wanted to do this, but it's, cl it's clearly a temptation that a, that, a, that a party who's losing 
a case will, will consider, uh, this would be simply impossible. I, I, I am sure it was always out of the question uh, whether assets could be hidden uh, from, from the eyes of plaintiffs. We know that the deployment of a multi-jurisdictional enforcement strategy has been long entertained by plaintiffs' counsel. A detailed memorandum prepared by the plaintiffs' litigation team and made available in the context of the RICO case here in the U.S. is entirely devoted to this particular aspect. I'm referring to the Invictus memo. The memo outlines in very broad terms the possibility of seeking enforcement in a number of nations where the defendant conducts business operations or has significant assets. And it also discusses some procedural hurdles to take into account. It even gets into who the, who the experts were going to be that the plaintiff's uh, counsel was going to retain and some of the other strategies involving parallel proceedings and so on and so forth. As of this morning, now uh, moving uh, forward, there are recognition and enforcement proceedings in at least three jurisdictions outside of Ecuador, namely Canada, Brazil, and Argentina. It appears that enforcement efforts have also been commenced in Colombia, but the, to the best of my knowledge, no court filings have been made yet. In the minutes that I have left, I would like to comment on what I consider to be the three main dimensions that affect the recognition and enforcement of the Lago Agrio judgment, and how they are likely to affect the landscape of transnational litigation as we know it. I will focus my attention on Brazil and Argentina and leave Canada for another day. So the three dimensions that I am referring to are number one, the domestic statutes, local rules, and the mechanics of litigation in each of the enforcing jurisdictions. Number two, the international law dimension, mainly comprised by treaties and judicial cooperation agreements. And three, the overall litigation strategies uh, deployed by the parties. So let's talk about domestic regime first. Each country has obviously its own rules. With respect to Latin American jurisdictions, there tends to be a misconception based on the similarities of the legal systems and common roots are fo as followers of the civil law tradition. The perception is that the procedural rule laws of these 20 countries that comprise the region are the same. Their legal systems operate more or less or never operate fine or right. This is not entirely true. Take, for example, Argentina and Brazil, the two countries that we're going to talk about for a few minutes, and uh, the ones that have immediate relevance to the litigation. Uh, and let's start with Brazil. There, the recognition and enforcement of a foreign judgment is regulated by a, number of, by a number of federal statutes, including the Code of Civil Procedure, the Law of Introduction of the Civil Code, and the rules governing the Federal High Court of Justice. Brazil is a federal state, so it has both uh, levels, both federal and state levels, but all of this involving foreign judgments uh, takes place at the federal level. <coughs> this regime entails a formal confirmation procedure carried out at the Federal High, High Court of Justice. In, in Portuguese, it's known as the Supremo Tribunal Federal, uh, and a subsequent enforcement stage led by the federal lo lower courts. So the recognition is at the highest level, and then it goes down to a lower court, and it will be treated as if it were a Brazilian judgment. Brazil does not require reciprocity for confirmation of foreign judgments, and this is important at the international level. And the standard for recognition involves the following statutory requirements. Number one, that the judgment is readily, readily enforcement in the jurisdiction where it was rendered. In other words, that it has produced, and this is really important here, res judicata effect, effects. So regarding these points, it is important if you, if you have taken a look at the Lago Agro judgment and are following what's going on in Ecuador, the judgment is still subject to review by the Ecuadorian Supreme Court, which has re yet to render a decision, so it's technically not final as of yet. But on the other hand, the judgment is fully enforceable as a matter of Ecuadorian law, because in order to avoid enforcement, there's a provision in Ecuadorian law that says the defendant has to post a bond for an amount equal to the judgment, so $18.2 billion, after the first appeal is decided, which obviously Chevron didn't do. So you have 
A judgment that according to the laws of Ecuador is enforceable, but that judgment is not necessarily final because the Supreme Court of Ecuador has yet to make a determination in it. Um, so the, the next uh, requirement is that the court of the state where the judgment was rendered had jurisdiction according to the Brazilian rules of international jurisdiction. So Brazilian courts are going to look at their own rules of international jurisdiction and they will determine whether Brazilian courts would have jurisdiction over any of the parties. And if they decided, I don't think they would, but if they decided that they did, then they, couldn't, they would deny recognition of the, of the judgment. The argument being, you could have filed in Brazil and you didn't file in Brazil. So it's, it's some sort of a blocking uh, statute there. That the parties had an opportunity to present their case, this is commonplace, the due process guarantees were afforded, or these allegations on corruption and all that will, will uh, probably become relevant at this point. That the foreign judgment does not offend Brazil's national sever sovereignty and its public policy. That's another interesting aspect. Let's assume that confirmation uh, is, is granted. Well, um, once confirmation uh, is initiated, uh, the defendant has to be served. According to my sources, this just happened a few days ago. So the defendant can oppose, has 15 days to oppose or to challenge confirmation. Another important aspect is the Attorney General is also given an opportunity to intervene, so he can opine on public policy and national sovereignty issues. Should the High Court of the, uh, confirm the foreign judgment, then the parties will have to seek enforcement at the lower court level in the same manner as domestic judgments. The petition to seek the recognition of the Ecuadorian judgment in Brazil was filed in June of 2012 by, on behalf of Maria Guinda and others. So this petition plaintiffs obviously asserts that all statutory requirements under Brazilian law has been fulfilled. But the court's analysis, the reaction by the defendant, and the position of the Attorney General are yet to be seen. Experts following the case have speculated about a number of possible defenses, including the possibility of asserting that although enforceable, the Ecuadorian judgment is not final until after the National Court of Justice has ruled on it. Another interesting point, a point sorry, is whether in the context of examining the compliance of the Ecuadorian judgment with Brazil's public policy, the High Court of Justice will look into the punitive damages element of the decision. That's half of the judgment. Punitive damages are not allowed in Brazil. They're not allowed in Argentina either. And remain one of the sore points in the development of civil litigation throughout the region. To this day, the only Brazilian court that has dared to dabble with punitive damages in the context of class action tobacco litigation was reversed in appeal. The only Argentine decision on punitive damages was in the context of collective litigation, and it's only a Supreme Court decision. There is an ongoing here debate in Brazil with regard to this issue, so it will be definitely interesting to see how it unfolds in this case. If the Brazilian court allows a foreign judgment containing punitive damages to be enforced in Brazil, it will definitely open a Pandora box. And as a matter of strategy, it will likely incentivize foreign parties or foreign counsel to use this route to circumvent local Brazilian rules. I'm almost running out of time, so what I'm going to do with respect to Argentina is I'm just going to compare it very quickly with Brazil. Argentina has a somewhat similar mechanism than Brazil. The main difference is that Argentina requires that the action in the state of origin was a personal action or an action concerning a movable asset which is currently in the Argentine Republic. This is particularly important because it prevents Argentina to be, uh, from becoming what, for, for lack of a better term, I like to, law, to call layover jurisdiction. Imagine the layover flights. You connect uh, from Miami to Chicago, you connect in Atlanta. So the same way plaintiffs or, or, or lawyers in general might use jurisdictions uh, just as a bridge to get to another jurisdiction. That is, you know, a jurisdiction where the parties are not intending to actually enforce the judgment, but simply use it as a vehicle to get to a third country. And some of these comments have been made in the context of using Canada as a, as a way to get to the U.S. Um, I think I'm al almost ran up, out of time, so I will leave it here, and I look forward to the comments. Thank you.
Okay, well, um, uh, thanks so much to the organizers for, um, for the opportunity to part uh, participate in this symposium. Um, in my remarks, I'd like to sound a note of caution about what lessons should be learned from Chevron about the law of foreign judgment enforcement. And, and first, I'd like to highlight several transnational litigation trends that I actually think Chevron uh, reminds us of. And in that modest sense, I think we can indeed learn some lessons from Chevron. But I'd like to devote most of my comments um, to four aspects of the law of foreign judgment enforcement that I think are susceptible to change as a result of Chevron, but perhaps more because of case-specific imperatives than because of a careful um, analysis of the broader costs and benefits of change for the transnational litigation system. Um, I think we should be cautious about drawing um, lessons from Chevron to motivate changes in the law of transnational litigation. And my overall argument can boil down to this. Um, Chevron is a hard case, and as the old saying goes, there's often a danger that a hard case will um, make bad law. So first, I think Chevron does illustrate several increasingly salient characteristics of the transnational litigation system. I'll touch on one. Um, Chevron illustrates uh, something that um, uh, my co-author Marcus Quintanilla and I have called the new multipolarity in transnational litigation. And we try to document this a little bit empirically. Um, and what we, um, this, this starts from this notion that Chevron, in Chevron, a US court um, uh, dismissed the case, closed its doors to plaintiffs, and then the case uh, proceeded in another country, Ecuador. And um, part of what we're calling the new multipolarity uh, has, is, is a broader trend with two related parts. And the first um, relates to changes uh, in doctrinal changes on the US side that have increasingly closed US courts to transnational litigation and made US courts less attractive to the world's plaintiffs. And these include the aggressive uh, um, approach to forum nonconvenience embodied in Piper versus Reno, um, Goodyear and Castro restricting um, personal jurisdiction in transnational cases. And I think Twombly and Iqbal really fit into this because of the, the um, stricter pleading standards make it harder for plaintiffs to get access to US discovery, which is commonly thought to be one of the big attractions of US courts. And um, analysis of data from the administrative office of US courts shows that at least um, certain types of transnational litigation have been on the decline um, over the last decade, which, which cuts against the claim that some make that we're encountering a flood of transnational forum shopping into US courts. Um, this also cuts against Lord Denning's um, famous saying that as a moth is drawn to the light, so is a litigant drawn to the United States. But I think this aphorism might be a bit out of date. Um, at least the light isn't shining as brightly as it supposedly once did. The other part, and this is, I think, much harder to get a hold of empirically, uh, is that there seems to be uh, an increasing preference for selecting non-US forums for transnational dispute resolution, both in torts through forum shopping and, um, and through uh, dispute resolution provisions and contracts. Um, in short, US courts seem to be declining in importance, at least relative to um, uh, some other jurisdictions, which I think are becoming increasingly important. Um, and this is what we mean by the new multipolarity. And this is what I think um, Chevron might be an example of. But even if there are some descriptive lessons to be drawn uh, about systemic transnational litigation trends, I think we have to be really careful about um, drawing prescriptive lessons about how uh, the law of transnational litigation should change. And to develop, this, to develop this point, I'd like to focus on um, four examples of issues surrounding foreign judgment enforcement that I think are susceptible to change in Chevron um, because of case-specific imperatives, uh, but that might not be desirable from a broader general policy perspective. And my first example is the fraud exception to um, foreign judgment enforcement. It's generally accepted that uh, fraud is a discretionary exception to the general rule that um, US courts will enforce foreign judgments. Um, accordingly, a, a court may but is not required to decline enforcement of a foreign judgment obtained by fraud. Um, the prevailing understanding of this exception is that it applies only to extrinsic fraud, not intrinsic fraud. And uh, extrinsic fraud is conduct of the prevailing party that deprived the losing party of an adequate opportunity to present its case. Uh, when the plaintiff deliberately had initiating process served on the defendant at the wrong address, uh, you get the idea. Uh, intrinsic fraud, on the other hand, is fraud that occurs in the foreign proceeding itself and would include, for example, false testimony of a witness or the admission of forged documents into evidence during a foreign proceeding. And the policy behind the distinction is that an assertion of intrinsic fraud um, should be addressed and dealt with in the rendering court. And the parties should be encouraged to raise these allegations on a timely basis instead of waiting until uh, an enforcement action in another country. 
Um, moreover, the rendering court uh, itself oversaw the proceedings and therefore might be better equipped to make judgments about fraud than um, a court in another jurisdiction that did not have direct knowledge of the proceedings. Um, if the judgment debtor alleges intrinsic fraud, the, according to this policy, the proper procedure is to raise it um, in the rendering court or on appeal uh, in the rendering court's jurisdiction. Uh, and during that process, the U.S. court um, should, should stay enforcement proceedings um, to let the fraud issue be resolved. Um, if the foreign legal system is incapable of fairly and impartially um, addressing the question of fraud, then the judgment would probably be unenforceable under the systemic due process exception, which I'll talk about a little bit later, so there would be another avenue for relief. Um, I think most of Chevron's allegations of fraud, as serious as they may be, are most fairly characterized um, as examples of intrinsic fraud. They're more akin to false testimony, forged documents. Um, uh, some of the things that have been labeled fraud, I think, are closer to corruption than, than fraud is understood in the enforcement context. Uh, but Chevron does have a legal opening. There are courts, um, the restatement of judgments. Other commentators argue that maybe there's not a sound basis for the distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic fraud. Um, and, uh, and so there may be a small legal opening here for uh, Chevron. Given the stakes and the seriousness of Chevron's allegations about the irregularities in the foreign proceedings, I think it wouldn't be surprising at all for a U.S. judge to take advantage of that legal opening um, and uh, deny enforcement on fraud grounds. Uh, but this could have the effect of either stretching our definition of fraud for enforcement purpose, purposes, not just in Chevron, but also in future cases, uh, or maybe abolishing the distinction altogether, at least in the jurisdiction of enforcement. Uh, the problem is it's not clear that um, such a change would be a result of careful deliberation about whether the policy rationale for the distinction is sound or whether this would be um, based on trying to uh, um, uh, address the imperatives of the particular case. A second example, which I'll just touch on briefly because I think um, Professor Erickson already dealt with this uh, really nicely, is this tension between forum nonconvenience and the enforcement of foreign judgments. And um, uh, I won't rehash the, the procedure, the, what, the, the different claims, but many people argue, as, as Professor Erickson mentioned, that Chevron uh, should be stopped from arguing that the um, Ecuadorian judiciary is inadequate, um, whereas when they argued at the uh, forum non-dismissal stage that it, it was an adequate forum. Um, Cassandra Burke Robertson and I have written uh, uh, on this in some, in some detail, and we concluded that, that given the different standards of adequacy at the forum non stage, which is very lenient, um, uh, as Professor Erickson said, and the enforcement stage, which is different, um, which requires a system that provides impartial tribunals and procedures compatible with the due process of law, if a legal system fails that test, a judge in the U.S. is prohibited from enforcing the judgment. Um, these are different standards. So the position of Chevron at day, or Texaco at the dismissal stage and Chevron at the enforcement stage, um, I don't think there's uh, an inconsistency doctrinally to set up an estoppel argument. Um, that said, it creates a problem, and our concern in the article that um, uh, Professor Robertson and I wrote is that this can create, um, in some circumstances, what we call a transnational access to justice gap, where you don't get court access to the United States because of forum non, and you can't enforce a judgment from another uh, jurisdiction because of the higher standard at the enforcement stage. Um, we do suggest, uh, and it would be great to talk about this more, we, we do suggest raising the standard at the forum non stage um, because we know that an ultimate judgment will simply be unenforceable in the U.S. if it's produced by a system um, that doesn't have procedures compatible with due process um, or impartial tribunals, um, that if you know that up front, um, why not keep the case in the U.S. anyway? Because the resulting judgment we can know in advance won't be um, enforceable. Uh, but I think Professor Erickson makes some great points that we need to think about. A third uh, area of law that I think might be susceptible to change is the due process exception to enforcement. And it's widely accepted that there's a mandatory systemic uh, due process exception to foreign judgment enforcement. And the 2005 Uniform Act, uh, for example, says that a court may not recognize a foreign country judgment if the judgment was rendered under a judicial system that does not provide impartial tribunals or procedures compatible with the requirements of due process of law. Um, traditionally, the failure of impartiality or due process in a particular case has been insufficient to trigger this exception. Um, and this traditional limitation is based on the pro-enforcement policy of U.S. judgment enforcement law. Um, as the Second Circuit in a, in a uh, Posner um, in Ashenden noted, a case-specific approach would be inconsistent with providing a streamlined expeditious method for collecting money judgments. 
from other jurisdictions. It would, in effect, give the judgment creditor, creditor a further appeal on the merits, thus turning every successful multinational suit um, for damages into two suits. And this view is, of course, controversial, but I do think that it reflects the, the, the policy behind um, U.S. judgment enforcement law as traditionally understood. Um, moreover, in principle, if a foreign system is systemically adequate, um, it should be able itself, through its rehearing and appellate procedures, to address case-specific um, deficiencies. So I think these are the policy reasons be behind the traditional reason for limiting the exception to systemic um, uh, in process problems. Um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and other uh, business-oriented lobbying groups have been invoking the judgment in Chevron, um, thank you, uh, in Chevron in the earlier decision in, in Dole um, for the proposition that we need some additional um, case-specific exceptions. But in both Chevron, um, Judge Kaplan's findings essentially on the due process, systemic due process exception already says that Chevron's likely to prevail on the merits if the judgment were be to be uh, attempted to be enforced there. Uh, in Dole, um, uh, enforcement was denied without having to resort with case specific to case specific exceptions. So I think these actually are examples of cases that show that our system as it is works pretty well. And um, it's not clear that there's a problem that needs to be solved. Uh, nevertheless, uh, these are powerful anecdotes. And the Uniform Law Commission and a, a number of states have increasingly adopted uh, the 2005 revision to the Uniform Judgment Enforcement Act, which has case specific exceptions. My fourth and final example is the potential use of investor state arbitration to prevent enforcement of foreign judgments. And here I'm, 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 I'm scared and I'm outside my bailiwick, but I, I just want to uh, um, uh, maybe, maybe this is something that will be addressed on the next panel. But um, in 2009, Chevron initiated um, arbitration against Ecuador pursuant to its bilateral um, investment treaty between the Ecuador and the United States. And the tribunal has ordered as interim measures that Ecuador take all measures at its disposal to suspend the enforcement or recognition inside or outside of Ecuador, the judgment against Chevron. And again, given the stakes and the seriousness of Chevron's allegations, I don't think it's surprising at all that the arbitral panel has provided this sort of interim relief. Um, but I think there's a bigger looming policy question that doesn't seem to be getting as much attention as it should. And that's whether it's a good thing um, to make investor state arbitration available as a mechanism for blocking enforcement of domestic court judgments. Probably the strongest argument in favor of such a rule is that the existing system, which is super decentralized, it's a conflict of laws system, is really messy. And uh, Professor Gomez you know, showed us how messy this is. We are in several different jurisdictions uh, regarding enforcement. Um, and a judgment creditor can go anywhere in the world where there are assets. And under that jurisdiction's law, try to uh, get enforcement. Um, but let me venture two concerns, a couple of which I think have already been addressed in earlier comments. Um, first, an order from an arbitral tribunal that a state suspend enforcement of a judgment of one of its courts um, obviously would have a serious adverse impact on the judgment creditors. Um, yet, judgment creditors are not represented in these proceedings. Um, if this proceeding goes forward and uh, there's a final order, a final award um, preventing enforcement of the judgment, uh, that's the, the, plaint the, the plaintiff's interest uh, relies on that, yet they don't have any opportunity to participate um, in those proceedings. The second, and Ralph Steinhardt has made this uh, point before, is that this type of order to suspend a judgment of one's own courts raises judicial independence questions. Um, uh, should an executive, should the um, Ecuadorian government be required to, um, to, uh, to overturn a decision of its courts? Um, my point is not that the existing conflict of law system is ideal or that there categorically shouldn't be any role for investor state arbitration. It's just I think there's some reason for concern that the facts of this particular case might create a precedent, um, loosely speaking, because I guess there's not technically precedent in arbitration, but um, a precedent that could come back uh, and haunt the United States if we're on the other end of something like this, uh, U.S. business and the principle of judicial independence. Um, let me briefly conclude. If, if Chevron's factual allegations about the Ecuadorian proceedings are correct, then I, I think it's awfully hard to get comfortable with an outcome where the judgment um, gets enforced. And these facts push powerfully toward non-enforcement. And this push toward a particular outcome under the facts of this case, I think, puts tremendous pressure on the law, per, uh, tremendous pressure on legal decision makers, judges, and then legislators. Uh, and um, I think it does so on each of the four issues I've discussed. And given the stakes and allegations and Chevron's skilled and aggressive and, and exceptionally well-funded um, legal team, I think there's a significant chance that, that the case will produce and already probably in some ways, maybe in the discovery context, produced um, some new law, some significant change in the law of transnational litigation. 
Um, it's uncertain whether this is a good thing for transnational litigation in general. Um, Chief Justice Roberts, um, uh, in a dissent, uh, argued extreme cases often test the bounds of established legal principles. There's a cost to yielding to the desire to correct the extreme case rather than adhering to legal principle. Um, that cost has been demonstrated so often that it's captured in the legal aphorism, hard cases make bad law. And um, to be clear, I think the lawyers on both sides have to do their best, the best job they can for their clients. Um, but I think we should be very careful about using Chevron prescriptively to motivate more general changes to the transnational litigation system. Um, Chevron may be a hard case. It's a, it's a very hard case, but I think legal decision makers need to, do the, uh, need to do the best they can to do what's right in this case, but without making bad law. Um, thank you very much. So before I open it to the audience uh, for questions, I thought I'd ask the panelists to reflect a little bit on something that came up in your remarks and that, that ties the two topics of the panel together, which is this question of the ex ante choice of where litigation will proceed and the ex post decision about enforcement. And um, Professor Erickson's remarks suggested that that first stage uh, process, whether it in the forum nonconvenience analysis, ought to be a really minimal test. Um, on the other hand, uh, Professor Wytok suggested that that might create an access to justice gap. And I, you suggested that perhaps the inquiry into the adequacy of an alternative forum at that initial stage ought to be higher if we can foresee that at the end of the day there'll be a problem enforcing uh, the judgment. Um, and bringing into it additional dimensions, um, Professor Gomez talked about the Brazilian system's uh, decision in its analysis of enforcement of judgments to look at that initial question of jurisdiction to say whether it could have been brought in Brazil in the first place or not. Um, and so, and of course, the initial, the ex ante question involves not only forum nonconvenience, um, as the, was the focus of this panel, but also personal jurisdiction doctrines, um, which are related in, in sometimes complex ways. So I wondered if you all could reflect a little bit on that sort of question of the relationship between these two sets of doctrines and whether we ought to link them together in some way um, or whether it's better to keep them separate, as, uh, as some of the remarks suggested. Okay. I'll start. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I mean, I guess I can, I can elaborate a little bit on why I'm not um, uh, convinced about the argument for, for keeping the, the standard low at the forum nonconvenience stage. Um, one thing, actually, that we, that we forget in Gilbert versus Gulf Oil, or maybe it was the other, Gulf, Gulf versus Gilbert, which was the, one of the early forum non cases in the United States, there was a factor, um, one of the factors that the court said courts should look to when deciding whether to dismiss on forum nonconvenience grounds is uh, the enforceability of the judgment. So very early on, it seems like some people were already on to the notion that maybe before we dismiss a case on forum nonconvenience grounds, we want to look forward and, and, and ask about what's going to happen with the resulting judgment. Um, I share some of Professor Erickson's concerns about U.S. judges passing judgment on entire legal systems, and I think that's a, a, a serious critique of the standard, but the bottom line is we've got it at the enforcement stage, um, and uh, it's measured in ways that don't look at, uh, it's not an attempt to predict the, what's going to happen in a specific case, but typically what judges will do at the enforcement stage is look at what expert witnesses say about the legal system. They'll look to State Department um, human rights reports that talk about rule of law. Judge Kaplan looked to the um, World Bank's uh, world governance indicators on rule of law to try to um, bolster his conclusion that um, Ecuador uh, doesn't have a system um, that, that satisfies the enforcement requirement. Since we know that we're going to have to deal with that standard at the enforcement stage, if we know um, ex ante that that standard isn't satisfied, then I worry about both the inefficiencies of sending a case um, abroad nevertheless and the fairness to the, to the plaintiffs. Um, so I think that whatever analysis, whatever conclusion we draw needs to take into account, I think, your valid concerns about uh, our system being paternalistic, but also take into concern the, the inefficiencies and, and fairness issues. So, when you talk about the bottom line, I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to, I mean, it's a normative question that we're asking. Mm -hmm. what, what do we think the test ought to be mm -hmm. for forum non, and what, should, what ought the test be for enforcement of judgments? So I'm not willing to just start with, well, we've got this at the enforcement end, mm -hmm. and therefore we should adjust forum mm -hmm. non. The question is both at the same time. Okay, so on, on that, it's important to distinguish, and you did a nice job of this in, in, in your comments and, and in your paper. The, um, meaning the paper with Cassandra, mm -hmm. the, uh, it, that there's a big difference between 
challenging the enforcement of the judgment based on systemic inadequacy as opposed to challenging it based on fraud or corruption in the particular case. The trend is towards look more at, at fraud, corruption in the particular case, but I think your point about the gap is really about ex post challenges mm -hmm. to the systemic adequacy. Um, and so it's, it's important that we, that we then limit this piece of the conversation to that. On that, I guess, I guess one thing I would want to just add is um, when there's been a forum non, when there's a forum non dismissal, there is at the same time the question of adequacy, which I think should be this very low standard, and a determination that the dispute really belongs in the foreign legal system. We don't have that when ex post we're talking about enforcement of a judgment. Maybe the case was first filed or first went to judgment in a foreign legal system. There hasn't been any determination that the case really belongs there. And so, so where I think my, my concerns about US courts passing judgment on the adequacy of, of foreign systems, I think where that concern runs the deepest and strongest is in the circumstance where we do have a determination that the case belongs, mm -hmm. let's say, in, in Ecuador, because that's where it's of the most concern. And yet, we're saying that even though it really is a dispute of that country, we're not going to trust that mm -hmm. country's courts to, to resolve it. We don't have that in, in the typical enforcement scenario. I'd like to add a couple of things. And, and uh, as a follow-up to that, even when the case gets dismissed by the US court, the US court retains this you know, passive power so that the, the, the case is not just, it's not really gone all the way. You know, there are these stipulations attached to it. In case it goes bad down there, you can always come home. Uh, even though this is not your home, but you can come back here. And the reaction on the other side of the table, which, which of course, US judges don't have to know, uh, but transnational litigators have to know, is that number one, at least you know, looking at this from the perspective of, uh, of the Latin American jurisdictions involved in this litigation, number one, that both Argentine and Brazilian and Ecuadorian judges uh, as well don't like this. Uh, it, it is problematic for them to see that the court in the US got the case dismissed it, but retained jurisdiction in a way. So it has been raised many times in, in four attempts to, to bring actions in those countries. The fact that, and the argument has been a least, least pendants argument, whether the, the US docket is still alive or not. And the argument is, well, if the judge there said, if things go wrong in Ecuador, you can always come back. What that essentially means is that the US the judge still has jurisdiction over the case. So what are you doing here? That's number one. Then number two, there, there is this issue of, the blocking, of blocking statutes, with, which was relevant at some point in the, in the when the Aguinda uh, class action was, was, was in the process of being dismissed. In so, at some point, Ecuador had this Law 55, that's the title of the, the statute at the time, that essentially punished Ecuadorian uh, plaintiffs who wanted to come to the United States. So, so courts in Ecuador uh, don't want their citizens to come to the United States. Well, at the time, that, that law was then deemed unconstitutional. Nicaragua has a, has a blocking statute as well that was passed in the aftermath of this this, uh, this litigation involving US companies. So the reaction down there is, is completely different. So I think part of the, part of the, miss, the, the missing component of this picture is, is how is it treated outside of the United States? Of course, that's not, again, and, and with this I, I conclude, it's not a role for the judges to decide what. But it is certainly something that litigators counsel for the parties have to take into account when thinking about you know, getting the case dismissed here uh, and going down there or whatever. So I just wanted to add that. Okay. Uh, questions from the audience. If you could please approach the microphones. It's an interim measure issued yesterday. Yeah. Howie, I'd like to take issue with your, your basic assumption that this dispute is fundamentally a matter of, of interest to Ecuador. We're dealing with a defendant that's a, a major American corporation. If they are to be held liable, then the American courts have a strong interest in making sure that an American corporation that is, has uh, committed a wrongdoing compensates 
the victims. If, on the other hand, they're found not liable, then the American courts have a very strong interest in making sure that an American corporation is not treated improperly. I, at the very least, it seems to be a standoff. I, I, I think you've dismissed the American interest much too quickly. Okay. Um. I would never say that, that this is a case in which there are no U.S. interests. Anytime you've got foreign plaintiffs suing a U.S. defendant, then, then you've got the setup for an argument that, um, that, that the U.S. ought to, the U.S. has an interest both because it's, you're talking about one of its own um, companies and, and because it wants to, to regulate its own companies and not necessarily have them regulated by the courts of a foreign jurisdiction. But on the other hand, you've got the plaintiff's interest. Um, to me, that is a somewhat hard question in the product liability setting, OK? You've got a manufacturer in one jurisdiction, and then you've got people injured by a product in another jurisdiction. Um, and, and there, the idea that we're trying to regulate the manufacturer of the product in Ohio or in the US um, is a pretty powerful argument as balanced against the interests of the plaintiffs who are harmed. And um, there's a way in which you can think of the Chevron Ecuador litigation as a kind of product liability case, but it is much more deeply an environmental case. Um, and to me, the balance is quite different there. When you're talking about, um, sure, a, a company from place wherever that then is alleged to have caused significant harm to the environment on the territory involving the natural resources of a different wherever. Um, that strikes me, uh, I mean, I, I guess we can just disagree about whether, whether it, that's an easy case on weighing the factors. But I do think it's important. So I take your point in general about cases where you've got plaintiff one, from one jurisdiction, defendant from another, and there are interests both ways worth thinking about. Um, the envir environmental case um, strikes me as a pretty powerful case. You realize the plaintiff chose the American forum. So, so that gets to a different question. Okay, so, so one question, so that gets to the question of to what extent should we defer to the plaintiff's choice of forum? And I think it's important not to mush that together with the question of where are the public interest factors the strongest? Uh, so, the, where you have a home court plaintiff, that files in the home court, courts tend to give quite a lot of deference to that choice of forum, as, as I think they ought to. Um, and so I actually do think this plays out differently in a case where you have American plaintiffs who choose to sue in their home state, or at least in their home country. Um, and I think US courts would be and should be more reluctant to dismiss those cases. But where you have a foreign plaintiff, um, there is much less deference to the choice of forum, as I think there ought to be. Could you please use the microphone, because I believe they're important. In this particular case, under the applicable Second uh, Circuit standard, the standard was that if there's a treaty that grants foreign plaintiffs equal rights of access to the courts of the countries, then the foreign plaintiffs should be granted, pursuant to that treaty, equal access with a U.S. plaintiff. So in this case, there was a treaty, and Judge Rakoff assumed that the plaintiffs should receive deference. So how would you respond then if there's a treaty where countries say we're going to give your foreign nationals equal access to our courts as our own nationals. I mean, is that just something that's irrelevant? And in terms of this not being like a product liability case, a lot of people think of this as an international law case, an alien tort statute case, case, but really most of the claims were basically tort claims. And so the issue, one issue that, that was never, it was raised, it was contested, but of course uh, not litigated on the merits. And when Judge Broderick, who was the first judge who had the case, declined to dismiss the initial um, motion, uh, the, the, the case initially, um, you know, what one of the th issues that I believe he was interested in when he allowed limited discovery 
was were their actions, were their decisions made in the US that gave rise to injuries abroad. So I don't think you can just assume that because it's an environmental case and the actual environmental injury occurs abroad, there's no US, there's no conduct in the US because quite often there are decisions that are made in the US um, that give rise to injuries abroad. So I, I agree that, that the, the assumption that this is just fundamentally an equity, that the case belongs to the forum um, as opposed to the plaintiffs and that you know, the US interest is just extremely weak. I, I, I share those I, I, concerns. I, I just, I can't, when I think about the Gulf oil spill and I think about the interest of um, of Louisiana and Alabama and Mississippi and Texas and Florida. I, um, I, I, I'm just trying to picture what you would have to tell me about how many of BP's decisions were made in London or anywhere you choose um, to persuade me that the most significant interest is not in the Gulf states. I, I, I can't imagine getting to the point where you tell me that because important decisions by BP were made someplace else, that means that the most important interest regarding that Gulf oil spill um, wasn't in the Gulf states. Uh, yeah. Next question. Uh, well, first, on, on that last point of, of uh, corporate control, it's, it's worth taking a look at the new uh, Shell decision in uh, the Netherlands and also uh, some a decision from last year in, in the UK Court of Appeal. Uh, a critique and a comment. Um, um, the critique is, um, I, I think Howie uh, and, and uh, Chris had um, analyses with brilliant internal logic, but Howie's and a portion of, of Chris's were premised on the, on the assumption that somehow enforcement is coming back to the U.S. courts, which there is zero chance of, and, and Manuel explained to us that in fact it's a Canada plus uh, two to four countries in Latin America analysis. I, I would add Ecuador, where, where there's actually some rump assets. Uh, and in theory, according to Pat and Boggs' famous Invictus memo, it's a 70 uh, jurisdiction analysis. Uh, and that points to the danger of once you let it out of this country, uh, there could be a, a race to the bottom. And, and I, I think we're now at a point where the, the evidence is so overwhelming that it's, it's less of a danger. But uh, earlier, you know, I, I could see a very flawed judgment being enforced. Here's the question. Uh, FNC is mainly Howie. Uh, when I studied Jed Radkoff's opinion, what, what, I, what bothered me most is uh, that he, he, it, there's no factor in, in the FNC analysis looking to whether uh, a, a particular case is high stakes and or politically charged. And as a reporter covering these cases all over the world, I think that makes all the difference. You know, when I talk to r Russian experts, they tell me, oh, well, lo rule of law is improving. Then I ask them, well, what about this case? Oh, well, well, of course, you know, not on the politically charged high stakes case. I, and I think it was, it was self-evident self that uh, those, those courts would not be able to handle a case of this sort, you know, maybe not of any sort, but certainly of this sort. Okay, so there, there, there are um, so high stakes and um, politically charged. Uh, the politically, uh, politically charged certainly can come in in public interest factors, but, I think, but you're saying that the high stakes politically charged don't come in as part of determining whether there is an adequate alternative forum. And you know, I, so, I, so I think your question is not can the political aspect of a story be part of the forum non-analysis? The answer is clearly it can. The involvement of Petro-Ecuador, the Republic of Ecuador, that's very much part of the forum non-convenience analysis that anyone would want to apply to this case. Um, but that's on the public interest factors. Uh, and, and so if, if I think you correctly hear me to be saying that I would not want the stakes of the litigation or the political chargedness or the complexity of, of, the, of the litigation to be part of the determination whether, that whether the forum where this case most appropriately belongs is adequate. Um, it, seems, it seems to me, you know, if, if a case belongs in the courts of a particular state or a particular country, 
than to say, well, you can handle that case, but not if we think the case is, um, is bigger than you can handle. Um, I guess that's the sort of, I mean, that's almost exactly the sort of paternalism that I think U.S. courts ought to avoid when thinking about other legal systems. Uh, thin ice um, here. Uh, we talked about ice this morning. I was thinking, Howie, as you try and analyze this problem uh, through the lens um, of um, not only sovereignty, but you know, uh, U.S. Uh, paternalism and our passing judgment about whether other courts meet our standards, et cetera. And um, the thin ice part was I was thinking of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and the recent charges that Walmart executives have violated uh, the act in Mexico through their various activities uh, associated with expanding in Mexico. Now, arguably, you know, and without any knowledge of the facts other than what I've read in the New York Times, um, and drawing on uh, cultural stereotypes, arguably the kinds of practices that have been alleged uh, that Walmart executives engaged in, in Mexico are common practices and, and normative within that culture. And one reads widely about uh, issues having to do with bribery and corruption that confront US-based uh, and other uh, European-based, et cetera, multinational corporations as they move into other cultures. Um, and one could argue similarly that who are we to decide that these practices are inappropriate and impose our standards on activities outside the US. Um, and you know what I think fundamentally the issue here is that we are living in an increasingly globalized world. It's trite, it's mundane to say, but it happens to be true. And corporations are particularly living in that world. Villagers in the Amazon may not feel that they are or should be living in that world. And we have a legal system that is inadequate for dealing with that reality. We don't have an international court that can deal with these kinds of private international disputes as contrasted with public international disputes. So I think these enormously difficult problems, like Chris, I think we should be very loath to change the law to deal with this hard case. Um, but I think we also have to challenge ourselves to move away from this kind of doctrinal law in the books Let's put aside the realities of the situation when we consider from a normative standpoint what is the proper uh, decision. Um, and as a segue to the next panel, one reason I feel that is that is driving us to the notion that the solution is to take these kinds of cases to international arbitration tribunals where these very same tough issues are being dealt with behind closed doors by privately selected decision makers. And I'm not sure that leaves any of us better off. Any reactions or is that it? Otherwise, I think that's a great segue into the next I, panel. That so is perfect. Um, we'll take, I think we can take um, a very short break until 4.15 and then resume. Thank you very much. It was nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Great. That was great. Um, that was fun. Yeah. Yeah. You know that your article is uh, required reading for the last class. Oh, seriously?